Let's do some more work on my nice new brother WP1 word processor. I have a port of CPM to this machine and it boots. My original plan for this thing was to use it as a terminal for a Raspberry Pi. I could connect the Raspberry Pi up to the UART belonging to the processor here. Sadly, this turns out not to be viable. This is a very cheap PSOC 5 development board. It's got a mini FPGA allowing you to wire up arbitrary logic to any of the I.O. ports. This wonderful cable. And that should, hopefully, be all the hardware modifications I need. The next chunk of work isn't going to be happening on the workbench because I need to go and pull up the Cypress development kit. See you on the desktop. So what you're looking at here is uh, the Cyprus, or rather now Infineon, since Infineon bought Cyprus, PSOC integrated development system. This is a frustrating combination of being brilliant and being maddeningly stupid. But I will just create a new project. Uh, the board we're using is the CY8C kit 049. So that's fine. We want an empty project and we're going to call this adapter and put it in PSOC. And you want the project name inside the workspace to be adapter. OK. And that has created a new empty project. We should be able to immediately build it. And I will explain what this is doing later. Uh, this is actually constructing the Verilog, which it's then compiling into the bitstream to program the FPGA. There we go, it's done. So program, and it has programmed the board. I have the board hooked up via a entertainingly ludicrous collection of USB extension cables to the desktop PC you're looking at now. I've got both the debugger port plugged in, which is what this programmed it with, and a serial terminal connected to the board itself. Okay, so first step, we want to get the serial terminal working. So what we do is we go look through the set of components that the thing supports, and we find a UART, which we drop down here onto the schematic. This is where we'll be designing the FPGA logic. Note, I keep saying FPGA. It's not technically an FPGA. It is something else beginning with a C whose acronym I can never remember because it sounds far too like uh, Java mid-P systems. So I'm just going to call it an FPGA. It's functionally very similar except smaller and a bit weirder. Anyway, this represents a UART compiled into our system. We can double click it and get various bits of configuration. It doesn't have any inputs or outputs because the way this is set up by default, it's controlled entirely by software, which is what we want. So we're gonna rename that to UART because we're only gonna have one of them. And you notice that even though it's set to 115.2 kiloboard, the, there's a warning here that the actual board rate is not right. This is because the clock rate at which the thing runs doesn't allow the, the UART to generate the appropriate board rate accurately enough. So we need to fix that. So we go over here, that's the wrong one, to clocks. This shows all the clocks used on the system. We have the standard ones here in yellow and one extra clock down here that was created by the UART. So, uh, yeah, the, the clock used by the UART here, you can see it wants 1.382 megahertz, but it only got 1.412 because it's limited to a set of dividers based on the system clock. So let's change the system clock. To do that, we double click here. This now shows us the clock tree. This is how all the various clocks are generated. 
uh, the this particular board the clock is generated from this thing here called an IMO uh, presumably that stands for something something oscillator it's not particularly accurate you can see here plus or minus two percent on the more expensive board because it's got USB on it it needs an accurate 48 megahertz clock for the USB but this one doesn't so this is what we get and by default it runs at 24 megahertz so let's fire up Windows calculator this is our clock rate now we're going to keep doubling it until we get a number in about the range we want so that's 29 megahertz 58.9 that's too high this thing only goes up to 48 it's the other board that goes up to 80 so let's try 29.491 okay and uh, now we can see here that these clocks now match much more accurately so if we go back to the schematic I want 115.2 it gets 115.1 that is good enough okay so now let us just build it this is going to generate the code for the UART which it uh, looks like it's already done it, which you can actually see here in the IDE. Uh, we're not going to touch any of this, but we need to build it to generate the source code to do the next bit, which is to actually, like, call things. So, because we've added a UART component, we need to initialize it, like so. And then here we can put in our code. Uh, so we want, this is why I wanted the IDE to know about the UART device, UART put string, hello world. Okay, so build again, done, program, and here is the output through the serial terminal. Excellent. That shows that our system actually works. Now, uh, there's a thing here called the resource meter that shows what, what resources are actually in use. And you can see that we've used one out of two serial blocks. These are dedicated components for doing serial stuff. We can build a UART from actual logic. In fact, it's got this one here. This is a simple transmit only UART intended for debugging. Uh, if we were to build this, uh, it will then generate this in Verilog, compile it to the bitstream, then compile all the source code again, which takes a while, there we go. And here in the resource meter we can see that we are still only using one serial block, but we that's interesting. I would expected it to use some logic blocks. Okay, uh, I reckon that what it's probably done is notice they're not referring to this anywhere and has optimized it out. Never mind. Uh, anyway, this is the main resource we're looking for here. This shows the uh, the usage of the FPGA block, and there's it, it's pretty small. We can't put too much in it. So let us start actually talking to the outside world. So let's shift this out of the way. Now, our device is plugged in to the brother word processor via various ports that I copied down. So we want to add some components to the schematic to represent the input and output ports. We have the address input, which is going to be 8 bit wide. Uh, we've got data input and output, which is 8, pin, 8 bits wide. And we have the control lines, of which there are three. So we call this address pins, number of pins 8, 
uh, display as a bus means that it emits a 8-bit wide wire rather than 8 1-bit wide wires. And this is the data pins. Now this is going to be an input and an output because we need to be able to read pins and write yeah, we need to be able to read and write data. So we have to be able to sense what's on the bus as well as assert our own values to the bus. There does have this bidirectional mode here, but this is subtly different from enabling input and output. So we're going to do this instead. Uh, if you have them both enabled at once, you want to turn on output enable here. This generates a uh, a second input. Uh, these are this thing here represents the inputs to the pin component which will be output from the board this is the output from the component which is input to the board this will enable whether we are outputting or not and again we want that to be 8 bit wide display as bus and control pins these are an input and there are three of them um, in fact I'm not going to do that I'm going to put three of these in so that we can name them different things so our three control lines are read write and IO enable. Right, we now want to assign these actual pins on the chip. And I did note down what they're all connected to. The UART has been automatically assigned to the correct pins. Uh, pin, pin zero and one of port four. Uh, let me, yeah, want to lock those to prevent them from being reassigned. Uh, now, read pin is on 1.6, write pin is on 1.5, and IOE is on 1.7, and it's automatically locked those. Uh, the data pins, which is, these are 8 bits wide, these are on port 2, all of them. And the address pins are on port oops, port 0. We even have a reasonable number of spare pins. Some of them are reserved for things like debugging and programming. But there's enough space here to add more functionality to this thing when we're done with it. Assuming it works, of course. Okay. So let us build this. For errors, um, okay, we do need to wire stuff up. So, uh, let's just wire these up to hard code these to zero. Don't think that's going to work. Let's just try that because this, I think, is going to be. Yeah, this is a one bit wide zero, so we actually want the constant generator, digital constant. And yes, o OXFF is correct. So the reason why I want to build it is data pin zero cannot be configured for output enable or input output synchronization when connected to UART SCB's UART CTS terminal. Uh, this is going to be because there is special logic attached to the to port 2. Okay, let's try just swapping these. 
So the address pins are now on port 2 and the data pins are on port 0. Let's see if that makes it happier. Cannot be configured for output enable or input output synchronization. That's interesting. Is connected. Oh yes, and we also want to set the modes here. The way the the way the bus is set up on the brother computer is that the lines all float high. They're connected to five volts via a large resistor, so that given no other control on the line, they will end up at five volts. Then, in order to apply a signal, a transistor in one of the components, such as a memory chip, will connect the line to ground. So that you end up with current flowing from 5 volts through the resistor and then through the transistor to ground. So we want to mimic this. The reason why is it means you can have multiple devices attached to the same, uh, the same bus line provided only one of them is trying to drive the, the line, then no current is consumed because the, it, the line is connected to 5 volts via the resistor and then not anything else. But any device can ground the line by simply turning on its transistor. And yeah, I think we can leave that as is. Let me just do the same thing for this one. This is the really important one because this is input and output. Uh, these are inputs, so the drive mode shouldn't matter. And build. As you may be able to tell, this is no longer the scripted part of this video. Okay, it really doesn't like me using port zero. Port one is in use by the IO pins. Port three is difficult to use because it's got the software uh, it's got the JTAG lines on it um, I have seen this before there's a workaround I can't remember what it is so I'm just going to go away and look that up I made it work what was needed was to change the constant value being fed to the output enable line from 0 to a 1 Apparently, if you set it to a zero, then the optimizer gets invoked and it removes various critical bits of the data pin logic, and then you get that meaningless error message. This is one of the problems with this tool. When it works, it's magic. When it doesn't, it's incomprehensible. It's full of weird rough edges, like if in Verilog you try to use a tri-state pin, you get completely meaningless gibberish. Turns out this Verilog dialect doesn't support tri-state, which is why we're using a uh, separate input and output lines with output enable, because, you know, you just can't do that. Anyway, it now builds and runs, and the text message has changed here. So let's see if we can do something a bit more interesting with this. So... Uh, we need to configure this to actually point, we need to configure the CPU to be able to read what's coming out. So we're gonna do that with a status register. This is a value that can be read by the CPU. So display as bus, and this is going to be address status. Okay, now it needs a clock. 
And for that, we are going to use the system clock. Uh, yep, HF clock, high frequency clock. And then we just need to wire this up here. So now the CPU can read this register and it will sample the contents of the data bus. And we didn't want the data bus, we wanted the address bus. Like so. And let's put another one in. Control status. And this is going to be one bit wide. And again, it needs a clock, which is again going to be HF clock. Okay, now we want the, uh, the data sheet for the processor. Did I remember to download that? Yes, H here it is. Uh, what you're looking at here is the the bus timing graph for a I.O. operation. This half has got the read cycle and this half has got the write cycle. So we're going to do reads for the time being. It's just to make sure that everything is hooked up in the right place. The way a read works is the CPU will assert I.O.E. and R.D. and on the bus, assertion means driving low. When it goes low, that is a signal for the hardware to sample the address of the address bus and place the data on the data bus a certain time later. Uh, and leave it there until IOE and RD are unasserted. So these, so a, a read operation happens when IOE and RD are both low. So internally, this thing operates with active high. So the first thing we want to do is invert IOE and RD. And then we want an AND. We go. And wire that up. OK. Uh, we're ignoring WR for now. We're also ignoring the data for now. So, the CPU can now read control status and that will tell it, it will give a one bit value that will tell it whether a read operation, whether a read IO operation is in action. So what we do is we go to our source code and we're going to do forever we want to, oh yeah, we want to build it. This is, building it will then generate the source code for the two status registers, to, which will make it much easier to access them because the ID will know about the symbols. Okay. So what we're going to do is wait for control status to become non-zero, that means a read I.O. Op operation is an access. Then we're going to read the address bus. Then we are going to uh, do we have S printf. We seem not to have S printf. Okay, we want to try and print the address to the console. So let's uh, okay. static for it.
this is a classic quick and dirty technique for printing a hex digit. There are better ways to do it, but this is pretty fast and it's not like we are low on flash space. So print the high nibble, print the low nibble. So print hex eight address. Uh, you want put char print a space. Now we're going to wait until the uh, the control line is zero, which means that the I/O operation has finished. And if this works, we should have a bus snooper, which is capable of logging all the I/O read operations that the computer is doing. Uh, it'll just dump the address. We're just we're not actually doing this to like use it in real life. I just want to verify that everything is wired up correctly. So, uh, oh yeah, the resource meter, you can see that our logic here has used up two macro cells and one unique p-term, whatever they are. Status cells are these things. You can have up to four of those. Control cells we'll get to in a bit. Now, I don't actually know whether this will work. The issue is the timing. It takes time for the CPU to do things. Uh, this is, of course, running at 39, uh, 29 megahertz, which is a lot faster than the HD 64180s for, I think, megahertz. And each operation takes multiple clock ticks. But we still have to get through the entire serial write operation in one, two, three, and a bit HD 64180 clock cycles. So I don't know if this will actually, if it's actually fast enough to do that. I'm hoping it will because this should be fast. It should just dump the values into the output buffer and then they'll get emitted asynchronously maybe but let's program this and of course nothing is happening because it's just seen gibberish because the computer's turned off so I will go and turn it on Well, I don't know if you heard that, but it made a very bad noise when I turned the computer on. This suggests that uh, our wiring is incorrect and we are doing something horrible to the I.O. lines, thus causing the computer to keep crashing while it's running, which is annoying. Oh, I reckon it's this, the data pins. I think this is probably trying to assert a one onto the bus. But as set to open drain drives low, asserting a one onto the bus should do nothing. Um, tell you what, let's just disable that and build because I wonder if I'm actually wrong about open drain drives low at least this is the only output pin so these should be safe program okay and let's give that another go Nope, that is in fact not working. I have figured out the problem. What I'm looking at here is the documentation for the CY8C kit 049 board itself. And it turns out that there is a capacitor on uh, pin 1.7. So 
this is the one that I chose for the IO enable line. That means that whenever this is plugged in, really weird things happen to the system bus. That's really annoying. There's actually two more. Um, what I have done in the past is to simply remove the capacitors from the board. I think what I'll do in this case is to just use some more pins. We do have lots after all. That means I don't have to modify the board itself. Here it is actually labeled on the PCB. So I'm going to have to do some rewiring and then I will come back again. Uh, the three control lines are now wired up to port 3.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. My first choice was uh, 3.0, 0.1 and 0 0.2. Unfortunately, it turned out that these are in use by the, uh, the programmer. So yeah. Anyway, you notice that we are actually getting lots of spammy output because it's working. This is recording what all the uh, IO read accesses are. And the computer is actually running and I was able to reprogram it and it continued to run, which is great. This shows that this approach does actually seem to be working. Okay, so let's turn the data pins back on again, even though they're not connected to anything. And uh, that they should be on port two. Is that correct? Looking at my notes, yep, that is correct. Program, so it rebuilds, and eventually it rebuilds very slowly. It's a single threaded compiler. And we still have stuff coming out, and it's all the same stuff. Excellent. So, what are we actually using? We're using about three quarters of our GPIO pins, one serial block a minuscule amount of FPGA resources and nothing else. Oh yeah, you notice down here, this chip's got analog stuff in it. It's not as flexible as the digital, but it's got some configurable pins, some op amp, some ADCs, stuff like that. None of it's actually enabled. So we could actually like use this to do things like, I don't know, measure the voltage of the brother word processors bus maybe I'd I mean I don't think we've got any use for the analog stuff but it's really nice to have okay let's actually start work on the real thing so we nuke all of this because we're not going to do it in discrete logic uh, come on delete 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 we're going to write this in Verilog because it's actually easier to do in Verilog. So to do that, we select the project, right click, add, uh, add symbol, components. I can never remember where things are. Add components item, here we go. Symbol wizard, right. This is going to create a new thing that we can put onto the schematic. And it's going to be backed up by some Verilog code that we're going to actually want to write. So what's this going to be? This is going to be our decoder. Uh, well, our bus interface more accurately. So we are going to have uh, data input, data output. Address input uh, IOE input read input write input. These are connecting to the external bus. Uh, we also want a output enable, which will be connected up to the data pins. We are going to want to have a system clock because lots of things need a system clock. And then we're going to want the things that we're actually going to wire this up to. So uh, I'm going to put those in later, I think. 
So this has defined our uh, component that needs a, this is just a drawing tool. So we need a bit of manual configuration. That's a bus. Uh, that's a bus. Uh, let's put that the right way round. That's a bus. Uh, this is a clock. Uh, I have seen um, arrows drawn to indicate it's a clock, but I'm not going to bother with that. Uh, go to properties. Can we change the block name? No, we can't. That's... I'm not actually sure that has done what I wanted it to. But anyway, let's go to generate ferry log. This is going to be our... Yeah, that's all wrong. That's annoying. Okay, let's... Here we go. We want to add it here. And we want to add set the name here create new there we go now it's called bus interface and it's shown up next to our design okay well that was annoying anyway, data read uh, address read io enable read write clock data write Output enable. These are digital outputs. Um, yep. Set these to be buses. Like so. Okay. Generate Verilog bus interface dot v right so this is the chunk of verilog that is representing that component so the ci sim here is the symbol definition this is the verilog here is our schematic so we go over to here to not that one we search for the bus interface component which is here and we plonk that down onto our schematic. And let's just do some rearrangement. Just line things up a little neatly. And wiring so address ioe read right we want our clock nearly everything verilog related wants a clock find out why later Unfortunately, that's not showing up as a bus. Why is that not a bus? That's a bus. I didn't save it, that's why. Yep, yeah. okay, now it's a bus. Uh, right, output from the data bus goes to data read. Output from the bus interface goes to data out and the output enable line follows it okay that should be all the wiring that is needed so we should be able to build that we're going to be adding some more stuff apart from anything else 
yeah uh, the outputs on there is no very log to define what these are therefore it's unhappy so let us write some code so this looks like a programming language, but it really isn't. Verilog is a way to define a set of equations that get turned into logic. So, for example, we want to say that OE is always going to be zero. Output enable, disabled. Uh, and likewise, data write is going to be a... 8-bit uh, wide zero constant. Now this will probably not build because setting OE to zero is going to cause the uh, huh, seems that loading the analog editor makes me think makes it think that we're using analog. Here we go. We get the same error again because OE here is a zero. So let's just set that to one for now. We can't program this or it will crash the board. and it builds. Okay. So let us define a, oh yeah, and our actual source code is all wrong. So what we're gonna do, well, we can define a few, uh, simple equations for, so that we know that the CPU is reading when read is false and IO enable is false so likewise see the CPU is writing when we have write and IO enable so we want to enable the output line only only when the CPU is wanting to read data. So this, whenever the CPU tries to read any I.O. port, it will enable the output and assert a zero. That will certainly crash the board because we don't want to... Uh, we don't we only want to respond to the address range that we care about so let's do this with um so let me think actually this is to start with let's just do this so if the address lines are set to OX40, then now we should have we should have an error. Uh, oh yeah, too much, uh, too much C. Uh, this is the syntax for hex constants. Eight bits wide, hexadecimal, four zero is the data. I picked four zero because the internal peripherals for this thing uh, appear at zero to three F. I've noticed, in fact, we should be able to see here that there are a number of other peripherals. You can see it's mostly reading from FD but it's also looking at places like 9b, 86, 60, etc. But it doesn't appear to be trying to read from 40. So I'm going to take a wild guess that that address is not used. So this should, if it builds, work. So we have slightly more complicated logic
boost. We've used a tiny amount of the flash, not a lot of RAM. Most of the RAM is actually occupied by the stack and the heap, and we're not using a heap. Oh no, it's not, sorry. The heap has been reduced to 128K, but I thought it was more, because I thought this thing had 32K of RAM, but it doesn't. Anyway, that's lots. But we should be able to program this. Actually, let's change this to a memorable number. So, program. And wait for it to build. And it's programmed. And now we head over to the board. OK, here I am at the workbench with the thing running. It's booted up into BBC Basic. It turns out that programming the board doesn't crash the computer, but if the board is plugged into the USB, then the floppy disk drive doesn't work, which is weird. I think that what we've got is like ground loop stuff causing noise, which is interfering with the ability to read the floppy disk. So I've unplugged it from the USB. The board here is now driving the, the PSOC board. So we should be able to just do uh, print get hex 40 and see what comes out. 72. Uh, let's do that again, but in hexadecimal. Forty. Four eight. Um, that is not the number that's supposed to come out. So four one is still returning. Port four one is still returning FF, which is what I would expect. Four eight. Okay. Yeah, let's go back to the... Let's plug this in, actually. And the computer still runs. Let's go back to the desktop and do some experimentation. So I think I know what's going wrong. Let me... How do you work this stupid thing, programmer? Here we go. Hex... Four eight. Uh, it's not that. Huh. I actually thought this would be. Uh, this would come out as five A, because I think that. I don't know whether the value on the bus is supposed to be inverted or not. I think not from looking at the. Looking at these. Problem solved. I was using the wrong drive mode for the data lines. So it was asserting bad data onto the bus. Setting it to uh, a resistive pull-up meant that I now get correct data. So I am performing a get. I have this little program here. And through the snow, you can see it is actually uh, returning 5A, which is the right value. Of course, I still went through and traced all the data lines before looking at that because, you know, it's more work that way. Anyway, back to the desktop.